Hello, and welcome to the uh, pre recorded Sunday school. We are doing John chapter 3, 22 through 30 today. Let's begin with prayer. Thank you, dear Lord, for uh, bringing us together here to just go over your word. Thank you for the, uh, these verses that John had written for us. I pray that you help us to expound on it, let it, deep, let it penetrate it into our heart, mind, and body, and let it help us to further your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let me go right to the right to the uh, verses to share here. So right here in verse 22, we start. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourself bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease." So we have here um, this encounter now. Uh, Jesus had finished the teaching of Nicodemus in that late night meeting. And we had heard many things that Jesus had to tell Nicodemus, this uh, Pharisee that came to him, that believed that he was a man from God. And now suddenly, John, the writer, brings us into a, another arena uh, for us to see how Jesus is functioning and moving forward with his ministry. So uh, here in verse 22, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So he was already in Judea, but it says he moved into the land of Judea. So there is a uh, First of all, there's no time frame here to work with, uh, but John takes us to a different scene in which the disciples are doing the, an assistance of the conversion of peoples that hear Jesus teach and preach, working miracles, and want to be baptized as a sign of their uh, public display and a spiritual change. Uh, the meeting with Nicodemus has no effect on the progress of Jesus' ministry and it seems to quietly drift off into the past at this point. Now, the countryside is full of people seeking a word from God. And Jesus' teachings are like, are like a, a sickle to wheat ready for harvest. And this is exactly what Jesus wants. Now, the symbol of water baptism for a spiritual rebirth is played out as evidence that Jesus practices what he preaches as far as being consistent in his teaching, which he plainly outlined to Nicodemus. Now in verse, verse 20, 23, and John also was baptizing in Enon near to Selim. Now because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. The baptizer was not far off from where Jesus was working. Jesus was just a few miles to the east to where the baptizer was still working his ministry. The place where John the Baptist was working uh, is described as a place flowing which mu with much water. This would make it a place where many farm and agricultural workers would congregate. Um, now, with the added presence of the baptizer, it offered even more incentive for people to come around to hear the message that John had for them. John the Baptist may have already uh, been aware of what Jesus was doing just a little ways off down the road. 
And in addition to that, he would certainly have knowledge of what Jesus had done in Jerusalem during the Passover, uh, which we could, you could review back in chapter 2. Um, verse 24, for John was not yet cast in prison. Simple statement. But for the writer John, it indicates here the fact that he is writing to an informed audience, or at least addresses an, an informed audience at this point. Perhaps he gives this away for those who uh, did not know about the arrest and the demise of the baptizer, depending on when the, this, this was read to some people. Um, he would leave this detail for the reader um, or the listener to inquire separately um, at a later time or, or already have the knowledge of the famous baptizer um, in, their, in their mindset. Um, in essence, it seems like John is maintaining a focus on Jesus and is getting to the point of what John the Baptist is about to testify. If you did not know by now that John the Baptist had been publicly calling out Herod for the adultery he was committing with his brother's wife. And then in verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. The Jews were very into the details and rituals uh, that needed to have, they needed to have things questioned and scrutinized in order to understand properly what was going on here. The confusion is justified and the actions of the two groups baptizing may raise an eyebrow if it were not addressed properly. The baptizing was seen as a cleansing process, purification, after the repenting of sin, and it was a commitment to seek and follow the Messiah. It was a significant public display, and if the country folk were doing it willy-nilly, the higher educated Jews needed a little more information before jumping into that water. So they wanted to have the matter settled before moving on to their next critique. It also is a dispute of who is the greater, who has the greater baptism. Of course, our hindsight would say that Jesus, of course, is the greater baptizer, but in an environment where words may travel quickly and might not be accurate, there needed to be a clarification. The best fact checkers will cut to the source of the subject, and in this case, being the two subjects, um, Jesus and John. John was the choice of these investigations, more than likely because he may not, because he may have been the closest at the time, or because they knew he was the first to start baptizing. It is only prudent that we ourselves should always pursue the source of where we hear things coming from. It is not just for it. an educated person knows that there needs to be a trusted source and that source needs to be known and it needs to be trustworthy. So this is part of the scrutinization. And it also is uh, sort of like, hey, we need to understand why these two groups are baptizing. And there's also the con a contention between uh, the people who are following John the Baptist and the people who wish to follow uh, Jesus. So in verse 26, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth and all men come to him. So just to say that they want to know, why is this Jesus baptizing? You know, you bore witness to him, and, and now look what he's doing. He's doing the same thing that you're doing. Isn't that our job? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Why is he doing that? So John the writer here is being very familiar with the baptizer shows us that the shows us first that the term rabbi is used by those who came to the baptizer um, with the question presented to them by the persons who were previously called the Jews by John the writer. 
So we see that um, these would obviously be the followers of John the Baptist, seeing how they address him as rabbi. Or on the second chance, maybe it could be John, uh, son of Zebedee, right, referring to him as rabbi, because he was uh, just in the recent past, his teacher also, and he would have called him rabbi. Uh, but to me, it seems that the majority of the population uh, attending this baptismal uh, would be Jewish anyway. So they were in Judea, and these residents were from the countryside, and the scrutiny was coming from the Jews, or probably the Jewish leaders. Um, but the true meaning of this statement is to call into question what are we doing here and why are we both doing the same thing? The question is a valid one. Whose baptism is carrying the real authority? And is there a division of sorts here? Should we be offended, confrontational, or maybe just join the other group? Uh, there's a lot that comes to the table with this simple inquiry. And in verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Now, I just want to say John the Baptist is very clear that he, that nothing can happen without, without the blessing of God. John the Baptist is there by the grace of God. He has been given uh, a, 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 a prophesying uh, ministry. He has given has been given the word that he will see the Messiah and proclaim him the Messiah and say he is the one, he is the Lamb of God. So John the writer, Zebedee, uh, records that the baptizer had said it is not known how he sort, I mean, it's not known how John uh, Zebedee got these words uh, from John the Baptist. But he was part of a group at one point um, until he followed Jesus. And that one day when he and Andrew were called to stay with Jesus into the night, talking about why he was the Lamb of God and all that John the Baptist had said about Jesus. So John, son of Zebedee, and Andrew had that night when it was pointed out to them by John the Baptist and said, there goes the Lamb of God. And then they turned from John the Baptist and started following Jesus until Jesus turned to them and said, you know, what do you want, basically? And they said, where are you staying? And he says, come and see where I'm staying because it's going to be a late night because I'm gonna have, you guys got a lot of questions, and I know. Um, but so John left the baptizer to follow a higher calling uh, than just the repentance, and is now baptizing people who are hearing the teaching and calling of Jesus. John the Baptist now speaks words that are meant for all men to hear, and John, son of Zebedee, lets us know that these words of John, Jesus was born of God and is to receive all that God has for him. John the Baptist, although a mighty prophet and truly obedient man of God, has received all that a man can receive from God. He has been given the knowledge of who the Messiah is and readies the people for him. The one from heaven must receive all that was sown for him by John because John was just the field hand for the master who will shine his divine light of truth on what is sown and will cause it to be fruitful. Now in verse 28, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Now John Zebedee, John Zebedee son of Zebedee, the writer, having been part of the baptizer's group, now hears again, that John the Baptist makes reference to the inquisition that he received from the Sanhedrin while in the, while in the wilderness by the River Jordan. The baptizer recalls that he is 
merely the herald calling out to all that are in the path of where the king is about to tread. The baptizer is called to be truthful and prepare this path for the Messiah. He also reminds his followers who he is, who, who he is not, okay, and what his role is. When a seed is planted, we wait for the signs of growth. We look upon that ground with hope and expectation of what is happening beneath the surface. We then become excited when that sprig breaks the surface and the sign of life and growth is evident. Now we know that its constant growth will produce stems and leaves and then branches and flowers and eventually fruit with more seed contained within it. So here John proclaims the kingdom has come and these things will happen spiritually, but not through him. Jesus is the one to be glorified. And then in verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore, therefore is fulfilled. I have a quote from Ellicott's commentary, which describes it beautifully this way. The friend of the bridegroom called by the Hebrews, Shash Ben, and by the Greeks, Paranin, was changed with the preliminaries of the marriage. He arranged the contract, acted for the bridegroom during the betrothal and arranged for and presided at the festivities of the wedding day itself. It was a position of honor in proportion to the position of the bridegroom himself and was given to his chief friend. That friend then enjoyed his joy and there was none brighter on that day than he. This is John's thought. Is This in John's thought is an illustration of his own position. The bridegroom is the Messiah. The bride is the kingdom of God. The church, consisting of all with pure hearts, are willing to receive him. The friend who has arranged the betrothal who has prepared these hearts is John himself. Now he stands and hears the bridegroom. Some of those who had been prepared by him for the bridegroom would have come, it may be, and told him of his words. He is now near at hand. Throngs crowd to him. The bride is approaching. Do they see in all this matter for envy? It is to him the consummation of all hopes. The life work has not been in vain. The cup runneth over and the joy is fulfilled. So we have this visual, that's the end of quote. So we have this visual that is supposed to come to mind at the mention of the relationship between John and his cousin, Jesus. John is all about Jesus not just because he is called upon to be a herald or prepare of matters before his onset into ministry, but because he truly loves Jesus and he is truly faithful in that love to him. He knows what must be done and does it honorably. It is all about the coming together of the bride and bridegroom and the celebration that is to come is all he is concerned with. And finally, I'm ending on verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Such sobering words from John the Baptist, such sorrow yet glee wrapped up in such a few words. Um, it's, 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 it, I have almost tearful, but yet joyful feelings when I hear these words that John utters. Um, this is a jubilation for John the Baptist, but also it is a tone of sadness in these words. The truth 
has always been known that if the baptizer were correct in what he was saying, that it would be inevitable that he must dwindle in popularity and influence so as the proper attention can go to the one he was heralding about. The introduction has been made. The details have been taken into account. The arrangements are made. The work is done and now all the attention needs to be turned to the arrival of the bridegroom. Sobering words, I, it still just makes me get goosebumps when I think about how John the Baptist must have felt when he knew how much Jesus was increasing, but he must be primary. He has to fulfill his ministry and the marriage and the consummation must come to fruition. And John is blessed to be a herald for that, a witness to that, to hear the voice of the bridegroom. And in that, you know, we also must heed the calling of John the Baptist and repent ourselves and come to follow the teachings of Jesus, come to know Jesus personally, to understand what he was saying in his, in his teachings to not just the Jews, but he was speaking to the future into us, into the church, into the, into the, uh, into the bride, which we are to be, to commit ourselves and prepare ourselves to be consummated with our bridegroom in Jesus, in the eternal. Thank you for attending this uh, pre-recorded Sunday school. I ask that you subscribe, ring that bell, uh, like, share, comment, uh, and just uh, share your thoughts and uh, share your prayer. Your prayers are coveted always. And I just uh, wanna end in prayer now. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Uh, thank you for the words that you've given us. Thank you for the, for the, for the writer, John, as he just lays it out plainly on who Jesus is, who John the Baptist is, and what Jesus' uh, ministry is and how it affects, affected the people then, how it, how it caused the church to grow and how it affects the hearts and minds and soul and spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless. And, uh...